need to hang that shield up right there and show that, show that mask. I was going to say, those are really cool. You're just saying this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll get them hung up so everybody can check them out. Shoot, I'll just show them to them. Yep, there's Tony's shields he's making. And they're not bad. Somebody just came in? No, it was oh. Tony. He went outside. I kind of like those. I like those a lot. So, uh, this weekend I went down to, uh, my name is Brian Wilton. I'm a Gothi and a folk builder for the Austrian Folk Assembly. And uh, so I've been doing this for a little while. And I do this all over the country. And um, tonight I want to kind of talk about what we got. Would you do me and everyone else a favor and explain exactly what is a goatee? Huh. You get to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Gothi is an individual that uh, when also true heathenry uh, was the primary religion or way of life or faith or however you want to perceive it of the tribes of the people of Northern Europe, you had two posts. You had a chieftain and you had a Gothi. The chieftain handled the martial aspects of the village and the Gothi handled the spiritual aspects of the village. So people would make a contribution, uh, food, whatever. So the Gothi would hold the feasts, provide guidance, provide counseling. He would provide the... the um, Can I start? Yeah. Oh, okay. You're fine, man. Go right ahead. You're not hurting my feelings. <laughs> he provided the spiritual guidance for um, the spiritual aspects of the community. Um, not like a preacher or a priest or a pope or anything. You didn't have to go through the Gothi to make a connection with the spiritual aspects that you want to enjoy. Uh, but he did provide the guidance, a, um, a way of thinking, a way of thought, perfect, um, so that the community would be on the same sheet of music. These old tales in the lore, uh, while they were written down, what, about a 1,000 and 1,200 um, they're a, a recollection of the oral tradition passed down through those ages. A lot of people wanted to cry them. All oh, they were written uh, by by uh, priests and all this other stuff. I don't really think the priests were smart enough to realize what they were writing down. <laughs> Be that as it may, it's what we have. Uh, my role for the Austro Folk Assembly is to also provide that same kind of spiritual counsel, guidance, and direction for the uh, adherence to also true and the members of that organization as well as others. In that role, I've written a couple of books and a few other things. Now, I don't necessarily speak for the AFA, though when the members in this region need some kind of guidance, I'm the one that provides it. But tonight, I want to talk about, this weekend I went down and gave a talk on the uh, spiritual journey of a woman. <laughs> it always comes across pretty harsh, as it should. There's some uh, painful truths in a lot of that that um, people don't necessarily want to hear. Tonight I want to talk about uh, the Reagan's Mall. And the Reagan's Mall and the uh, Fafnis Mall are a couple of tales that document a young man's journey when he leaves the home. And for as long as I've been around in it, it's always been recalled as a great hero's journey. But the more I look at it, the more I realize it's not necessarily a great hero's journey. It has amazing and striking parallels to the transition that this way of life is making into the modern day world. And a lot of it centers around greed. Um, and I talk a lot about greed <laughs> in the uh, Voluspa, the Poetic, and the Prose Edda. There talks about three all-powerful Jotuns that enter uh, Asgard. One of them's name is Goldveg, one of them's name is Hyth, and one of them's name is Hrostief meaning the love of gold or lover of gold or gold drink, the bewitching one, and uh, the horse thief. And these three individuals represent greed. And they represent the, the beginning of the downfall of Asgard. <laughs> now the Reagan's Mall is, is a perfect example of what greed does to everyone involved. Okay, It's also an example of how a man acts, talks, walks, and behaves when he is busy building that political system or church whose sole purpose is to convince others that only the battles worth fighting are the ones they point out. And that is a common practice today because people are so 
comfortable being programmed by what, what they watch on television, they will listen to and buy into the bill of goods someone is selling, saying, you need to hate that person, you need to fight against this individual, you need to do this, you need to do that, and all of these great things you have to suffer right now, you'll lay up a great store of treasure in heaven. So for a little bit of work right now, when you get done with all that, you can coast on easy street and everything will be hunky-dory from here on out. <clears throat> it's a powerful short changing of what we were really put here to do. When we were given the original gifts by Odin, Billy, and Vey, I don't really think they gave it to us so we could fight someone else's battles and then coast long to get to Easy Street. Um, see, th those are the kind of lies that are easy to convince people of. You know, the Reagan's Mall is, a, is, a, is an interesting parallel to that. So you have Sigurd, who um, his father's obviously already gone. He's wandering through the woods. He uh, comes across this place. He, he picks up a horse. And he, he meets Reagan. Okay, Reagan is this short, powerful, skilled in magic, very ancient being, and he takes him under his wing, so to speak. Now that that's interesting in and of itself because there's <laughs> whenever a man leaves his home, a boy leaves the home, it's always told he, he leaves home in a homespun garment. He leaves home with the garment that his mother has made for him for him to go out into the world. Balder is a prime example of that. He leaves the home, um, and then when he, he his wife joins him in Helheim, she sends back the homespun garment that he that Frigga made for him. It's kind of a sign that he's cut those apron strings to to partner with his wife and no longer rely on his mother. But the other aspect of that is is that when a man leaves his home, his father's no longer the primary influence in his life, but he's not yet a complete man. When he leaves the home, he usually finds a mentor. He finds someone that can provide him guidance or skill or instruction. He learns a trade. He joins the service. He, they're senior NCOs. They're skilled craftsmen and labor unions. They teach and mentor, they, even with a coach in a martial arts gym. Uh, there's a, there's a, a senior masculine entity that guides, coaches, and directs that young man to becoming a full-fledged man. <laughs> when... The young man picks someone who may not necessarily have his best interest at heart. It will lead him to several painful crossroads in his life. See, Reagan is, like I said, he's skilled in magic, fierce in, term, in disposition, short. Um, but he's this powerful, dynamic individual. But Sigurd is a sucker. He gets suckered in like most young men do when they come across someone they perceive as being cool. And that's generally what happens is young men, they're not with their father anymore. He's too old fashioned. He doesn't really know what's going on with the modern world. They go find somebody cool they can hang out with. And cool only goes so far. See, he's full of information and he's willing to share it with him. And, and most young men fall into this trap. And we see it predominantly with inner city youth who are absent of father in the home or any home for that matter. We find someone they think characterizes the idea of masculinity. They fall into the wrong crowd. They start trying to hustle on the street. They take up a cause which creates the deadly mixture of impetuous youth and righteous indignation. Working a hustle for the easy money. <laughs> the uh, recidivism rates, the incarceration rates for young men are astounding. And this is the primary cause. But see, the numbers are not as important as identifying the phenomenon. They, um, young men will find a mentor they perceive as successful in the environment they're in, right? So if you're in the service and you're in a tough environment, you're going to find the toughest son of a gun to follow, right? If you're on the streets, you're going to find somebody that's making a living and succeeding. If you're in a labor union, you're going to stick with somebody that knows how they're doing it. <laughs> but if you're absent if you're in that environment that's not necessarily conducive to a successful way of life, that's the majority of the world of young men. There's only, what, there's one million people in the service now or two million. It's not very many out of 370 million. Women will do the same thing. See, the uh, if it happens to be a man always searching for a way to make a quick buck, what do you think he's going to be doing the rest of his life? He's going to be looking for a way to make a quick buck. <laughs> and see, the shine of that treasure, that's Hythe. That's the bewitching one. That's the, 
That's the confusion that becomes in men's minds. See, the flip side of that coin is Christianity. So they start off with this whole process. But what we need to realize is that Reagan's scheming. See, it doesn't really matter if Sigurd can do it or not. Reagan has time enough to select another candidate should Sigurd fail in his tasks. Reagan will train him, teach him, and manipulate his thinking process by drawing him into Reagan's quest for vengeance. <laughs> he will teach Sigurd about an enemy that has nothing to do with him. And how many people buy into the idea of fighting for something that has absolutely nothing to do with their way of life? All of us do. See, that this process works at the personal level, the community level, the national level, and indeed even on the world stage. And through a complex instruction that includes feeling sorry for Reagan, who he perceives as a strong mentor because the gods, his father, and his brother all wronged him, Sigurd is in possession of a willingness to prove himself and his loyalty to his mentor like any son will do for a father. Most monotheistic faiths, use the same tactic when they talk about our father who art in, right? Same principle. Sigurd does this in some respects to earn that moniker of masculinity. Men confer masculinity upon other men. No woman can confer masculinity upon a man. They don't know what that is. They've got questions of their own. Am I beautiful enough? So on and so forth. <laughs> the icing on the cake is the possibility that there might be a huge reward he gets to share it when it's all over like a whiff of smoke from a distant fire. The curse of this gold bewitches the mind of another man. The love of gold doesn't even possess, or doesn't even capture the imagination, and so begins the arduous journey. See, the idea of gold is the substitute for the idea of heaven, and Reagan is the thinly veiled character representing the Pope, or any other oligarch, monarch, monarch chieftain, socialist, communist, or liberal, using men to fight wars that they themselves cannot. So Reagan takes him under his wing, starts teaching him this skill, teaches him how to work iron, forging his mind, teaching him how to think about everything. And the underlying concept which drives the thought process is not one of growth, but a love of gold. The parallels to this day and age are stunning. Like Reagan, like most men of today, are not passing on the knowledge of our ancestors. See, we sacrificed that long ago. We're still trying to figure it out. Now, we are teaching our boys to subscribe to the longing for gold, and that a life of indebtedness will suffice. We've convinced everyone that the idea of debt as a currency is a suitable substitute to own that big house or be more important than everyone else. Um, that's not how it works. I mean, it works right now. What happens when it stops? Before we're done with our task of instructing our sons and daughters, we send them out into the world so they might better focus on our own punishing task of chasing the carrot on a stick. <laughs> so the brutal demonstration of Odin sacrificing himself as an example for men to follow becomes a far more endearing action and one which, in my mind at least, inspires an amazing amount of loyalty. Not to mention the confidence it breeds in, ridding, in taking the action of ridding oneself of their ego. Reagan's ego convinces him that he is the one who should have the gold at this point. Now, the story of Reagan and the gold is, a, is an important one. So you have Odin, Honir, and Loki walking along one day. And they come across this otter, this big fat otter, sitting at the side of a lake eating a fish. Loki takes a rock, beans him in the head, and they kill him. They think they've got something good. It's important to recognize that the otter is a uh, the otter's present in a lot of mythologies across the world. The uh, average person has about 65 hairs per square inch, 65 to 80 squares per per square inch on their head. An otter has like 180 thousand. So it's this luxurious, warm, protective fur. <laughs> but when they go to the nearest household for an evening's hospitality, they realize they've killed the son of the man that owns that home. So they say, you owe me shield. You owe me for taking the life of my son. Doesn't matter that they didn't know, they killed him. So the price is you'll lay out that square, that otter fur, you're gonna cover it with gold, and that will be the shield. you got to cover every square inch of it. So they send Loki out. Loki goes and, and finds this, uh, finds Andavari's pool. <laughs> Andavari is this slimy little creature that has all of this wealth collected in this pool. 
He captures them. He gets all the gold, all the wealth, except for one ring he wants to keep for himself. And Vari throws a curse on it. The curse is such that whoever owns it, it will. it's going to turn them into this beast that the only thing it wants is more gold. And you can see the manifestation of that mentality that the witching aspect of gold transform men's lives all around you. Let them get a little gold and see what they turn into. Let them get a little gold and see what they become. All they want is more of it. And it really doesn't matter who they hurt, destroy, what they lie, cheat, steal, what they do to get more of it, they will do it. Reagan is feeding all of this line of bullshit to Sigurd to bring him into the world. So he will fight this battle for him. <laughs> Sometimes we call it patriotism. <laughs> <laughs> but we also call it a holy war. We also call it a crusade. We also call it any number of things that would inspire men to want to do something we no longer can physically do. Reagan is doing this and through constant talks and he's having a little warm, heartfelt discussion. All of it is this manipulation for this young man going into the world. So he's picked a mentor, but he's picked a bad one. Okay? <laughs> it's not doing him any good. Anyway, as they move forward, it's, it's a ridiculous amount of money to compensate for pain and suffering. And, it's, and that, that concept is, is present today, too. Anytime there's pain and suffering in someone's life, there's a car wreck, uh, if there's a faulty product or something, or there's a loss of life, there's enormous amounts of money that are, that are awarded in settlements as if a, a, a pot of gold might be sufficient to alleviate the pain of loss. That concept is still with us today. The fact that it was there thousands of years ago is no uh, simple coincidence, I don't believe. <laughs> we have, uh, so right there we have an analogy that carries from that day to this day. That these greedy people, and I say greedy, I don't necessarily mean greedy. I mean, they're people that are in pain begin to believe that all of this will make it go away and make it go better, make it better. But that's not how it works. <clears throat> See, the courts routinely award um, victims with settlements which are wildly outlandish. Now, Reagan, remembering the actions and attitude of his father, has made sure that Sigurd, the impressionable young man, also has that entitled mindset. Why well, he should be, he should get something too, right? <laughs> now, I wrote this here. One may not surmise the attitudes of these divine beings who allow themselves to be captive in this home, but they do send Loki to handle it. Who better to magnify the failings of mankind as a punishment? The one who is an example of such a shallow human mindset to begin with. No torture could be as great as the product of the uninspired human intellect full of jealousy and resentment. Loki arms himself with the tools he knows can handle the job, Rand's net. He heads back to Anvari, he gets all the gold, and the legendary net uh, captures all the treasure of all the drowned sailors. The prose editor records the scene in this fashion. The Aesir offered a ransom for their lives, as much wealth as Rydmere himself desired to appoint, and a covenant was made between them on those terms and confirmed with oaths. Then the otter was flayed, and Rydmere took the otter skin, made them fill the skin with red gold, and also cover it altogether, that they should be that should be the condition of the covenant between them. Thereupon Odin and Loki Odin sent Loki into the land of the black elves, and he came to the dwarf called Anvari, who was a fish in the water. That's also important to remember. Loki caught him in his hands and required of him as in ransom of his life all the gold that he had in his rock. And when they came within the rock, the dwarf brought forth all the gold he had, and it was very much wealth. The dwarf quickly swept under the under the dwarf quickly swept under his hand one little gold ring. But Loki saw it and commanded him to give it over. There's your greed. <coughs> The dwarf prayed him not to take the ring from him, saying that this ring he could multiply wealth for himself if he might keep it, much like Odin's armband. Loki answered that he should not have one penny left and took the ring from him and went out, but the dwarf declared that the ring should be the ruin of everyone who should come into possession of it. Loki replied that this, this seemed well enough to him, didn't bother him any, and that this condition should hold gold 
good, provided he himself brought them into the care of them, they should receive the ring and the curse. In the poetic and the prose of the ring is mentioned as a powerful object and one which will help rebuild the fortune he is losing. In the prose edda, it is Odin which takes the ring for himself and only gives it up when the last whisker is found to be exposed. So there we have this complicated structure of, of greed. So the father teaches Reagan how to be greedy from that example right there. Now Reagan, his brother is a little more greedy. He manages to cure it for himself. He becomes Fafnir. Reagan gets to wander around, feeling sorry for himself, gathering power till he finds some sucker young man, say, hey, come with me. Let me make you something important. Let me show you how to build a sword. Let me show you how to do all these wonderful things. <laughs> now, in the story, Reagan has done a lot, okay? Um, he, he tells him all of the story, and looking at it, you would, think, you would seem to think, well, these greedy people screwed each other over. The, dog, the father gets killed. Uh, Fafnir kills the father, the daughters are scattered to the wind, and Reagan gets sent off on his own. <coughs> and Fafnir becomes this great giant dragon protecting his wealth. This is the lesson that Reagan has learned. This is the lesson, this poisonous lesson of greed that he is teaching Sigurd. Sigurd also has to do something. He has to avenge the slaying of his father. So there's an important dynamic that appears twice in this story with regards to what he's got to do. Now, the first time when he's wandering in the woods, he gets the broken pieces of his father's sword. See, Odin gave his father the sword put together, but his son gets the broken pieces of the sword. His pride shattered that gift. So now he forges it. He makes something fantastic. It makes something, they, they lay a string of hair in the water, and as the current carries the hair, the, the blade slices right through the hair. It becomes this amazing thing. So now, <laughs> now they go on the journey. And it comes to it when they get on the boat, they head out to sea, and a great storm comes up. See, the, um, I should have I skipped over that. This is the first curse, spawned out of jealousy, fear, and hatred, and Vari will not be as worth as much anymore. And people are the same way. The very threat of being diminished in some way creates a chaotic situation in the mind. What will I become if I do not have this or that? The threat that we might become a victim begins to hold sway over our thoughts. In a sick twist of mental gymnastics, we find ourselves entertaining the flip side of ego in an instant. We find that we relish the attention we get. And so, so-and-so took something from me. Feel sorry for me, people will say. They become the victim. And Anvari, Anvari uh, epitomizes that aspect of what we're doing. The wealth of our being as perceived by the ego in this world is always at risk of being lost. Fear drives the thought process and actions of such lesser men. Around every corner there is a potential boogeyman. Somebody is going to take something from me. And as Milton Friedman, the Nobel winning economist, Nobel Prize winning economist wrote, that the president when he takes office has about nine months to enact his plan. <laughs> if he doesn't, the opposing party generates enough fear in the American, in the voting public that this president doing these actions is going to take something from me. And he loses his momentum. The rest of his presidency is usually just coasting along. The wealth of our being perceived by the ego is always at risk of being lost. And that is a manipulation. This is part of that programming. This is from the personal level to the national level, this concept of convincing someone that I'm going to take something from you, you're going to be less than, is this poisonous thread woven through our politics, through our spirituality, through our daily lives, and intera interaction with each other. <laughs> this tale, thousand years old, shows us how that works. But the, um, then it gets even better. So he goes and collects all this treasure. Pride Mark gets a case of the red ass and says, well, you gave it not kindly. Well, what's that got to do with anything? It's something I see every day, and it astounds me. He's just accumulated a true fortune, and yet he has the audacity to complain about the manner in which it's given. People that complain about their paychecks entertain a similar attitude. There is no gratitude for the opportunity to trade your time for someone else's dollar, only disdain. It's a weird type of thinking which suggests to the person that they are more important and ought to be paid more 
from the current employer, never once thinking that this may well be all the job is worth, and never entertaining the idea of self-improvement to move up the ladder or out of the door to the next job. The whole concept serves to create in an evil-minded man, the bewitching aspect of gold, a reason to continue disliking or hating someone and feeding his body the chemicals produced by the brain. <laughs> and that's kind of a complicated thought process, but look at what we see with the trade unions. Look at what we see with individuals that that, uh, well, they've worked 40 hour a week and all they've made is 250 bucks. I ought to be worth more than that. Go do something that's worth more than that. The value of what you generate in this world is in direct proportion to the skill set you have and how hard it is to replace that. But we have this funny little thing going on that keeps telling us, oh, well, we're worth more, we should get more, so on and so forth. <laughs> that's our ego talking. But in a weird sense, it's not telling us, hey, go back to school, go learn something new, go start a business. And that's one of the reasons I support all of these little businesses. These are people that have made that realization, that have stepped out of that game and said, hey, I'm going to build a dream for myself. I'm going to build a bookstore. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to begin making something on the side to better myself. I'm going to do something to demonstrate to the world I am worth more than that. Instead of sitting on my laurels and trying to convince some other young impressionable mind that I'm worth more than that, you should help me get it. So we have this amazing dynamic. Now, with regards to our spirituality, it also is apparent. <coughs> so have you ever learned that misery loves company? Well, when Pridemore gets stabbed by Fafnir and he's starting to die, he starts to... People that are sad all the time, they like to be around people that are sad all the time. They like to be around the kind of people that feed that sadness. They like to be around the kind of people that that make them feel good, that they, the attention they're getting is worthwhile. <laughs> so while Rodmere is dying, he begins to talk to his daughters. And it's a sad thing. See, Fafnir Reagan asked Rodmere for a share of the wealth that was paid for the slaying of their brother. And he said no. So Fafnir just straight up stabbed him. And while he's dying there, he called to his daughters. And he said, fled is my life, mighty now is my need. So now he's a victim. And he can't convince his sons otherwise because they're already completely convinced of the value of that gold being worth more than the life of their father. But the daughters, on the other hand, they're going to get told a different story. <laughs> and one daughter says, though a sister loses her father, seldom revenge on her brother does she bring. But a daughter, woman with a wolf's heart, if thou hast no son with the hero brave, but one wedge the maid for the need is mighty, their son for thy hurt may vengeance seek. So he's spreading his poison. Even as he's laying there dying, he is convincing his daughters, you need to make sure your sons fight this fight that's not even theirs and get this vengeance. So not only is Reagan spreading it, this father has made sure that the daughter spread it as well to their sons. This bewitching aspect of gold, the love of gold, the horse thief that steals the teamwork from the family, these aspects are working in homes around the country today. And our lore is pointing it out from thousands of years ago. So that poison is going to continue to go down. That misery loves company. These daughters are going to miss their father. These fathers, these daughters are going to, they're going to miss their father and they're going to try to put on their sons the ideas of what they want their sons to become, and that will be the lessons they learned from their father. Reagan's doing the same thing with Sigurd, <laughs> and the daughters are doing the same thing with their sons. The sickness continues to move down through society. Part of the reason Ossetru is here today is to break part of that cycle, so that when our children grow up, they step out of the home in the same fashion that the children stepped out of the homes that Rig visited, when they incorporated the divine into that union of marriage. Those children move forward into success, not cursed with these age-old traditions of greed. <coughs> also true, is spreading is changing that. It's supposed to be anyway. <coughs> See, he is trying to make sure his grandsons are going to be just as sick as he is. Many times I have pointed out that we have developed our outlook on life based upon the patterns of behavior, comments, and actions we have seen our parents, teachers, and various leaders engage in. Few want to believe it. 
Fewer still are capable of identifying those negative thought patterns and realizing that the people we have loved the most may well have given us the worst information. But if there's anything Austro can do for its adherents, it is to change the paradigms which led us to such a point in life where we had to figure out a new spirituality. Fafner took all the gold. Thereupon Reagan asked to have his chance, and Fafner refused. <laughs> Reagan asked counsel of his sister, how should he win his inheritance? She said, in friendly wise, the wealth shalt thou ask of thy brother, and better will. Not seemly it is to seek with the sword Fafner's treasure to take. So she said, don't go fight him for it. You're going to lose. Man, that's good stuff. So Reagan, through the years, I've counseled a lot of people that carry with them old wounds. They carry those wounds with them through life like a badge of honor. And in short order, it becomes who they are. They have, this has happened to them, or that has happened to them, or somebody wronged them. How many men and women do you see that have not successfully dealt with the pains their parents caused them, or the pains their exes have caused them? They go through life still feeling very much wronged in that, and it's a damn hard thing to get through, but it is essential that we do so. We can't go through life being that victim. That's exactly what Reagan does. He spreads his mental infatuation and sickness in the same way his father did to his sisters. People today do it as instinctively as breathing. They go to church to make sure that the, that mental infatuation is reinforced. The church of their choice, the church of their choice, of course. They go to the political rally for the same reason. Catching ourselves instructing youth with opinion as opposed to true wisdom is the great challenge of a generation and who may well be the first in their line, the first heathens in 2,000 years in many cases. That's our charge. That's our, that's our charge to, uh, to change. So all of this is happening. This is the pattern that's established at the beginning of this story. See, for Sigurd, on his journey, gods and kings come to help him along the way. And just as they come to, the, to us from the past to prevent to the present via the written words which outline the wisdom of our people. They're throwing us a rope, so to speak, to break this cycle, to come out of this ridiculous uh, nonsense that we call the modern world. Um, <coughs> they're giving him an opportunity to give up this folly of another man's quest for vengeance. And the moment we begin to approach our lives with the proper focus upon ourselves and our development, we also uncover the value of who we are. See, Sigurd has attempted to remain steadfast in all of it. You know, he does the right thing. He's, he stays steadfast in dedication to handle the business of his ancestors. Otter did so by remaining faithful to Freya. Odin did it by sacrificing himself to himself. Odin picked up the runes. Sigurd and Otter both have an, an encounter with the divine. In Otter's case, we see a combination of faith and also true and an ancestral connection which allows him to handle a wolf on his heels. Now, the... the um, tale about Otter and Freya is, you know, it says that Otter is ever faithful. Often were the stones turned to glass under the fires of his sacrifices. The blood was ever present on those stones. So he keeps asking Freya for a favor. Well, we've already got all these gifts to be what we're supposed to be in this world. He keeps calling on Freya, hey, grant me this, hey, grant me that. So she grabs him up, turns him into a wolf, said, let's go journey to Odin because he offers all these gifts. Along the way, <laughs> she calls out to Heindla. Heindla comes out and she says, Release one of your wolves, for I will not tire my worthy steed. Now, a lot of times people say, Well, Freya was riding Otter disguised as a boar, but she says right there, She's not going to tire her worthy steed. Otter's walking beside her disguised as a boar. She says, Cut a wolf loose on his ass and see if he'll pick up the pace to get where he needs to be to become what he needs to become using the gifts he's got. And I've written a whole chapter on that. It's a very interesting deal. I say so myself. <laughs> you see, each day we're peeling away another layer of the conditioning we no longer value. <laughs> now, when Sigurd begins to go on his journey, he gets the sword pieces from, from uh, Odin. But when they take off on the ocean, and they meet all the requirements to become a man. And Reagan decides he's got what it takes to slay Fafnir and he can get all that gold for himself. 
They take off on the ocean. There's a big storm. And Reagan cowers on the deck. And lo and behold, the man on the mountain appears. Now, that journey, the first part of that journey is Sigurd is going to take vengeance on the people that killed his father. So while he's handling the business of his own ancestors, he gets that divine intercession. He gets that Odin comes down, calms the water, and tells him exactly what he needs to do to slay these enemies. Never fight with the sun in your face, attack at dawn, so on and so forth. And there's a whole, there's a whole story what he's got to do. He goes and handles that, then he goes back out, and he's on his own again. They go, they find Fafnir, they find the treasure. Fafnir goes and gets a drink of water every day. So this huge, bloated, big dragon uh, drags himself out of his cave. Reagan digs a hole along that path, lays in the hole, and when Fafnir goes over him, he stabs him in the heart. And there's this long question and answer scene between the two where Fafner asked him, why'd you kill me? Who are you? Why would you want to take my life? Why would you want to steal from me my treasure? I don't know you. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> There's no straight answer for that. He won't tell him his name. He won't tell him his name primarily because a dying man knows your name. He can put a curse on you. That's kind of the reason for that. But... There's a legitimate question to be asked there. Why are you screwing these people over so you can get ahead in life? Why are you causing this individual? It doesn't matter how ugly, hideous, horrible they are. What business do we have causing these individuals pain? We have our own lives to move forward. And it says real clear, if we take care of our own business, there's going to be some kind of guidance there to help us along the way. But he jumps over here, slays this individual he has no business slaying, so somebody else can be rich. Reagan, as all of this is happening, is hiding behind a rock. So that's twice now. Reagan hid on the boat in the storm. Now he's hid behind a rock. When things get tough, this powerful, super cool dude, well, he's not so cool. He's not got his back. He's not what he said he was going to be. <laughs> Sigurd is out there on his own. So in the meantime, he comes running up, says, all oh, this gold is mine, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Reagan finally, or Sigurd kind of figures out, hey, I, I might be kind of getting screwed here. So he cooks, he pulls out the spit, he, he pulls out the heart, puts it on his spit like Reagan tells him to do. He gets a little bit of it on his finger and he, he touches his fingers. And this is where he learns the language of the birds. The language of the birds represents the flows of energy from what I can best to gather. Birds understand magnetic fields. They know how to migrate. Even if they're born in captivity over here, they can migrate and get to where they need to be. They understand how energy moves across the earth. When Reagan is sitting there, or when Sigurd is sitting there cooking the heart, and he gets a little bit of it on him, he has that awakening. He has that kind of spiritual experience that allows him to see things for what they really are. He's been suckered into creating this devastation so another man can be rich. He begins to understand the flows of energy. His eyes are open that he's been suckered. <coughs> and in that instant, he realizes Reagan's going to kill him too. He kills him first. He steps out of someone else's, when someone else makes the decision for him, what it takes for him to become a man and becomes a man in his own right. He understands these language of the birds, this flows of energy, and the language of the birds shows up all through our mythology, and indeed it shows up in many mythologies around the world, and it always is a hero who begins to understand some new kind of aspects to his being so he can become something more. Once he realizes that, once he cuts sling from that poisonous thought process of greed that says, you need to do this to be successful. You need to do that to be successful. If you do that, you'll be man enough. But never once hearing that you are man enough. And once he begins to open his eyes that this is an endless list of tasks that he may never get, may never accomplish, and he will never hear the words "you're man enough," and it will probably lead to a uh, an untimely death. He cuts sling on that idea that's poisoning his own life, that's pulling him away from his task of what path he's supposed to really be on. And it is the language of the birds which tell him to do that. Now, interestingly enough, this is when the masculine becomes the masculine and come, interacts with the divine feminine. See, the divine feminine has her own task to deal with here. So after he saddles up the horse and uh, 
after he saddles up the horse with all the gold he's got, he takes it, he comes up to a mountain, the birds tell him there's something up there you need to go see. And it's a ring of fire. And in the middle of that ring of fire, there's a body laying there in a full suit of, of uh, Bernie and mail and war weapons and everything else. <coughs> As he is now a man, he has what it takes to cross that ring of fire. And that's something that if you're still fighting someone else's battle, you may not necessarily have what it takes to walk through the fires. And those fires are important because through the other side of those fires, after you've slain the dragon, so to speak, and become aware of what it means to become a man, now you have what it takes to cross those flames and secure love, that competing opposing force, the yin and the yang, the whatever you want to call it. Because inside that fire, he thinks it's a he thinks for all intents and purposes it's a man. But he has what it takes to cut away the Bernie because of the sword that he forged and express and allow a woman to express the beauty of who she is to the world. This is one of the most powerful tales of becoming a man and creating an environment, crossing through the flames, dealing with all of the things, and creating an environment or creating a situation or being strong enough to allow a woman to express who she is to the world. I have found no better tale that tells this. Cut the slings on those things that society says you need to do to become a man and pay attention to the flows of energy in the world to become that man. And in doing so, you have what it takes to cross those flames, to cut away that casing that this woman has put around herself to protect her beauty and allow her to express that to the world. What a powerful challenge that's laid out in front of us. And while it may be somewhat confusing in the presentation, I assure you that when you read through that and you see that, you come to the realization that this faith of Ossetru is creating an environment where men are once again allowed to be men. Not the toxic masculinity that I see this report, the American Psychological Association. I read that report. All of the things they're talking about in there, that is not masculinity. That is some nonsense that I see men dealing with who have not slain the dragon of their own life. And once they slay that dragon, all of that nonsense these psychologists are talking about fades away, pales in comparison to the real task of crossing through this fire and cutting away that burning to expose true feminine beauty in the world. And that is a great challenge. That's the kind of thing that says, yes, I am man enough. Nobody's going to tell you that more than likely. <laughs> but the first thing she does when she steps up, when they... He, he creates the environment where it's safe for her to express this beauty of who she is. She offers him a memory draught. She offers him a drink. A drink of mead and begins to explain to him the runes. Now the problem with it is this. Young men have to deal with being suckered into what everyone else believes masculinity is. Young women have to deal with the idea of what their fathers taught them femininity was. She is pricked with a sleep thorn because she picked a man that her father decided wasn't worthwhile. So she, she said, well, I am not going to pick just any old boy you decide. I will not be with man until he proves himself worthy enough. There's the man that proves himself worthy enough. <laughs> but in that pain, in that resentment, in that isolation against being able to have the healthy father in the home, the woman creates this environment to protect herself. She also loses out on the ability to understand what it might really mean to be a woman in this world. So she begins to teach Sigurd part of the lore. She teaches him a portion of the runes. She gives him a portion of the memory she understands. But since she isolated and separated herself from it, she doesn't have the full part of it. He's already created himself into a man. She was already a woman, but only part of it. The two of them together on top of that mountain represent the most beautiful aspects of a fine union of marriage that I can imagine. A fully formed man, strong enough to create an environment where beauty might be expressed. And a woman who has what it takes to create that inspiration in a man that they might enjoy what we don't talk enough about of in also true and that is love because that is the most powerful of forces you can imagine the frequency of it are beyond belief <coughs> even only understanding part of it they create a fantastic 
union of the two. And I think that that's where most people in the world today are at. We understand a part of it and we are getting an inkling. We are getting a hint. We are having a, a taste of what it might really be to be that couple that Rig might visit so their children might become something more. We're getting a hint of the idea of what it means to be people that can care about each other, that aren't going to get tied up in fighting for greed of some other man's war or creating environments where our daughters may not feel safe to express who they are so that men can grow up to become men. Masculinity can be conferred upon other men and femininity can be conferred upon other women and the two might have this wonderful thing. This is the tale of Rig. That's where this is the failure of that. This is the absence of that divine intervention. This is the absence of the incorporation of the complete aspects of the divine into their marriage. Because when they come down off of that mountain, what happens? They become bewitched. They become suckered and bamboozled. And she ends up with some other man. And he ends up with some other woman. And there's there's great glory and great battles and treasures and all the other wonderful things that make up a, a, a wonderful tale. But in the midst of all of that tale, there's a pain of two people who at one time loved each other very deeply, but now no longer have what it takes to share that love. Because they didn't have the complete understanding of what these spiritual truths might really mean. The lay of rig is the presentation of what it means to truly incorporate the divine into our marriages. <coughs> Sigurd and Brunhild are that cautionary tale of what happens when we don't focus on that divine aspect of what it means to love one another. So when I, when I point that out, that's always a very painful thing to realize, that it's kind of a scary thing, too, that we may have been shortchanging ourselves to what all this might really represent. But it also, if we have the power of thought to realize that, we also have the capability to develop it. And this is where also true is at today. We're still trying to find where we are. We're still trying to find out what we're supposed to fight for. We're still trying, should I stand against this? Should I stand against that? What should I stand for? Well, what you need to start standing for are those powerful relationships that incorporate the wisdom of all of this divine knowledge so that our children might become wonderful, powerful, successful individuals and men and women in their own right. And that's what I've got out of this lay. That's what I got out of the Reagan's Mall and the Fafnis Mall. That's what I get out of trying to be the best Gothi and also true I can be is to create those individuals that might walk forward in this world and never have to second guess the challenges that are in front of them because they inherently know and understand that they have what it takes to survive and thrive, whatever environment they might be. And that's what better moral high ground could you have in this world? So that's kind of what, uh, that's all I got for tonight. But that's kind of where I'm at with it, and I hope you enjoy it. That, that all came out of, uh, thank you guys. That all came out of uh, life and the love of life. And you got, well, you got like four copies over there? Yeah, I, if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to pick it up because it's, uh, it's a fantastic tale. And obviously I go more in depth, but... Uh, and that's kind of what we got to go for, isn't it? We've got to figure out where we are first before we go out and try to save the world on someone else's behalf. <laughs> it is a really good book. I've read it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, that's kind of a tough one to talk about, isn't it? <laughs> well, I appreciate everyone coming and paying attention. Thank you very much.